A big thank you uh, to uh, Mr. Barr for your speech and for answering th those questions. Thank you very much again for that. So this leads us straight into our next panel discussion entitled The New Reality, Banking After the End of Low for Long. The moderator of the session is Maria Tadeo. She already introduced herself just now <laughs> with a question. European correspondent for Bloomberg. Maria will introduce the panelists, so please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Connie, and again, thank you so much to uh, Mr. Enria for putting together this conference and his team, too, every year. It's a pleasure uh, to be here, and uh, now let us introduce our wonderful panelists that we have uh, today on this topic. On the far end, we have Claudio Borio, who is the head of monetary and economic departments at the Bank for International Settlements. Next to him, we have Stephen Van Rixvik, who is the chief executive for ING, uh, Stuart Graham, who is partner and the head of bank strategy at Autonomous Research, uh, Monsieur Jean-Pierre Moustier, who is the chairman of the supervisory board at Ariel Bank. And next to me, we have Professor Elena Carletti, who is uh, professor of finance at Bocconi University, and you also sit on the board of Unicredit. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, Mr. Borio, the title of the session is The End of Low, now switching to uh, higher for longer. I wonder if you could perhaps take a step back and uh, give us a setup of what this has meant uh, in practical terms. Kind of big picture. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, let me start by saying, well, first of all, that I'm delighted to be here for what is Andreas in Ria's last uh, e ECB Forum as chair of the SSM. I'm sure he will be <laughs> back plenty of times in the future. So let me say that uh, clearly uh, the end of low for long is very good news for banks. Uh, it provides a, an important boost to uh, net interest margins and therefore underlying profitability. I'm sure they were looking uh, for this for, for quite a long time. Um, having said that, I think that the, there are three but um, the first but is that um, the transition is going to be bumpy. Mm -hmm. The second, and I'm sure we will hear much more about that later, is that there are still some very important underlying structural weaknesses in, in the banking sector that we have not been able to sort out. Um, and that has to do, and that is reflected in particular in very low price to book ratios. And the third, I will not say it now, I will basically mention it, save it for later to keep the suspense going, but it's, it's about a very important long-term challenge that the banking industry is facing. So let me elaborate on, on the first, uh, the bumpy road ahead. And I think it's important to realize, I'm not sure how many people do, that the situation that we are facing is unprecedented by uh, post-war standards, Second World War standards, uh, and in fact probably unprecedented even going further back. Mm -hmm. And that is that for the first time we are witnessing recession risk, there is clearly recession risk around the world, while at the same time in, in a context of the conjunction of a strong monetary policy tightening to bring inflation down, and widespread financial vulnerabilities. And by widespread financial vulnerabilities, I really mean in, in terms of the big picture, the fact that debt levels are historically high, that asset prices are still quite elevated. And we're coming out of a very, very long period of exceptionally low interest rates. So we're really seeing what the legacy of that, of that is. And let me clarify what I mean by unprecedented. If you look at the post-war period, particularly for advanced economies, you can, uh, you can see that there is a very clear divide in the mid-1980s in terms of the types of recession that you, we've had. Until the mid-1980s, the recessions were largely driven by higher inflation, monetary policy tightening, and that had to bring the inflation under control. But the financial system was repressed. And the fact that the financial system was pressed meant that there was little scope to see the overt financial instability that we saw later. Following the mid-1980s, the financial system was liberalized, central banks and structural forces brought inflation down, and therefore the types of recession that we saw were more like the result of big financial expansions, strong credit growth, strong asset price growth, strong risk taking, that were basically generating the subsequent contraction and the, and the GFC is the greatest, uh, the most obvious example of that. So that we shifted from what were inflation induced to financial cycle induced recessions. What we're seeing now is the combination of the two. 
And this is sort of raises some important questions because first of all, we haven't seen it before. And second, of course, the room for maneuver for central banks is much more restricted than it was during the second phase. Now, it's important also to realize that what we have seen so far, so far is just the materialization of interest rate risk in the United States, in the non-bank financial sector. And I would say that Credit Suisse was a bit of a, a bystander, a, a bank that had a broken business model and then was caught in the turmoil. But what's ahead of us, and it is ahead of us, is the materialization of credit risk. And the only question is when and how intense and whether the banking sector is prepared to sort of deal with it. Now, there is a certain, what I would call, impatience illusion here. I mean, the, the lag between the materialization of interest rate risk and of credit risk can be, can be quite long. So how strong is the financial sector? Now, in that context, the first question to ask is how large can the losses be? Now, and some analysis that we've done at the BIS, which roughly is similar to what uh, the uh, IMF has come up with, is that the, the actual losses that could be ahead of us could be quite large in, in, a stress, in a stress scenario. So if you assume, for example, that interest rates could be, say, 200 basis points from where they are now, or have been recently, then the type of losses could be as high as those that we saw during the uh, great financial crisis in a very sort of outside scenario. Now, of course, the banking system is much better capitalized. It's much better capitalized than it was before the GFC. Having said that, if you look, for example, of, at credit ratings, whether you look at standalone ratings or all-in ratings, they have actually deteriorated since the mid-2000s, uh, 2010 actually after the, uh, roughly since then, obviously since the great financial crisis as well. And one unknown here, I would say is, and this came up uh, in a number of uh, cases before, is the exposures and the state of the non-bank financial sector. Because the exposures to that sector tend to be rather opaque. That sector has grown in leaps and bounds since the great financial crisis that was partly intended. But still, there, are, there is hidden leverage, there are liquidity mismatches in the sector. And what was not intended is the fact that the regulation, the prudential regulation from a systemic perspective in that sector has lagged behind. Uh, well, thank you for that. And you gave me a perfect uh, segue to the next question for Professor Carletti, because Claudio just talked there and he said, we've only seen a, a, a a minor part uh, play out. And I know that you and I were talking behind stage uh, where you said this change in cycle and the tighter policy, it's not just rates, there's a whole universe uh, around it. Uh, what do you mean by that and how does it affect uh, banks and financial institutions? Thank you, Maria. First of all, good morning to everyone. I also want to thank uh, in particular Andrea for the invitation to this conference. It's a pleasure and the honor to actually be here and be able to speak uh, on this occasion. So let me come to the question, just to complement what Claudio said. That when I mean that there is more than rates, I mean we are going across a period of tightening of monetary policy more generally. And when we look from the perspective of banks, they have already been taking some action that have affected banks quite importantly. For example, the change in the condition for the TLTRO funding, or the change in the remuneration of the minimum reserves. And now the current discussion on how big these minimum reserves should be. So so far, let me say, the banking sector has gone through these changes quite well, in the sense that in aggregate, there were issues concerning, for example, cliff effect related to the change in the condition of the TLTRO, but this cliff effect have not materialized, or at least not yet, uh, using the words of Claudio. But going forward, there may be some asymmetries and heterogeneity, in particular in terms of small versus large banks or across jurisdiction, depending on how much the, various jurisdiction, the banks in the various jurisdiction were actually relying on the use of central bank funding, for example. So at the moment, a little bit of an increase in cost of funding, a little bit of missed gains in terms of lack of revenues from the remuneration of minimum reserves, but not substantial effect. <coughs> But going forward, in particular on the uncertainties that monetary policy is creating on some decisions like the size of the minimum reserves, 
this may, be, may have an implication. So it's very good in that sense that the supervision is within the monetary policy, that the two can talk to each other and can really take a sort of a holistic approach as to what a monetary policy decision should be. Perfect. And uh, now let's go to Mr. Van Rijkswijk, because uh, in your recent earnings uh, that you put out, um, and just to cite you, you say, uh, and it goes perfectly into the title of the session, you say the cycle of uh, central bank uh, hikes has obviously affected positively the profitability of financial institutions and banks, but you also say this appears to have paused. And what it seems to me is that you're saying it's not a sustainable growth model just to focus on that one aspect. So I wonder first a general question as to how you believe uh, this change in cycle has uh, meant for banks, but also what happens next? Because based on what you say here, no longer you've gone from low, it's over, higher for longer, but you're already thinking what comes next. Well, I mean, clearly uh, interest rates have been uh, negative for uh, quite a long time and I think uh, uh, it has now benefited the banks that the interest rates went back to, let's say, positive levels, but also with a positive interest rate curve, uh, which we haven't seen for a long time. So, uh, uh, although we think it is good, many people are, are a bit surprised by it and I can understand it because it hasn't been there since 2014. So, that is certainly when that changes so rapidly, then it will cause some nervousness in the markets or nervousness with the population. Still, I think it's good that banks have good profitability. And at the same time, what you do new see, now see is that with the polls in rates of what the ECB has announced, or what the Fed has announced, that, and we have seen it in previous cycles, that interest rates and also deposit rates gradually move up. That's just a given. And we've seen it in all the cycles in the past. I think the main difference for what we now see compared to what we saw in the past is that the the interest rate increases from, let's say, minus 50 basis points to around 4% took place in a matter of 18 months. In the previous cycles, these hikes took place in approximately three to four years. So the speed with which interest rates increased was dramatically faster than we saw in the past. That's also a bit the disruption that you're talking about. Um, and what we see is gradual competition coming back. Banks uh, look, of course, at their balance sheets and their own businesses in the different countries. So for us, that's different in Germany than in the Netherlands, than in Belgium, than in Spain. But still, uh, you see gradually, and depending on, let's say, the, um, <coughs> the balance sheet composition, the amount of assets and liabilities in the market, the way that your strategy is in terms of trying to acquire new customers, the products that you want to feature, that, is then, that then causes competition. And therefore, it's a matter of time before interest rates move up further. And the speed of which, again, like I said, depends on competition. That's why I said it. Okay, excellent. And can I just ask you just to uh, go back to what you say in, in your own earnings? You do say uh, so far it has been good for profitability, but you also suggest it appears to have paused. Should we read that as the positive effects, the implications for, for banks? This is not going to ride through into 2024. You, you need something more in the strategy. It's not just a, a sustainable growth strategy to depend on, on higher rates. Well, I mean, look, clearly, I mean, I'm, 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 I believe I'm here in the house of the people who, who determine the rates, so the question is also more, uh, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> to the monetary side of, of this, uh, this, this, uh, this institution, uh, uh, but basically based on the announcements that were made by the ECB, I made that statement. Uh, clearly, and that goes for our bank and for a number of other banks, but if you look at ING, uh, we are 80% of our revenue comes from interest. Um, uh, I will not complain over the past 12 months or so we have been held by the higher interest rates but if you look at any business model uh, that has 80% dependency on one type of input and 20% only on other inputs which in our case is commissions you have a business model that you can still improve in the balance and I've always said when I started in my role that I need to improve that balance and we, we will keep on working on that. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Graham, I wonder, uh, what are your thoughts so far that we've heard uh, on the panel? And I wonder, we talked about this improved profitability, which is obviously tangible, and we've seen it reflected in, in earnings. But then why are valuations perhaps not more attractive? W what is the reason behind it then? Yeah, look, I think there's um, three reasons, really. One is um, the perception that European banks are over-earning because interest rates have gone up very quickly, and as Stephen said, deposit costs have to catch up. So there's a sense that they're over-earning on net interest income and they're over-earning on uh, uh, asset quality. Bad debts are going to go up, and obviously nobody knows how much that's going to happen. The second is financial repression, whether that's banking taxes or MRR, this sense that... Uh, shareholders own the losses but don't own the profit, somebody else will take that away from them. And then thirdly is muscle memory, just European bank equities have been a very 
bad investment for investors for a very long period of time, and that kind of mental scarring takes a long time to, to go away. There's this perception that somehow European banks or European policymakers via the banks will always find a way of disappointing you. So I think people are very reluctant to buy into a this time it's different um, argument. I mean, if we look at the, um, I think we'll come and talk about the financial repression one in a second, but if yes. we talk about the, the over-earning, um, I, I spend all my days talking with investors. Every conversation I have is, how much is net interest income going to decline 2024 and 2025 versus 2023? So everybody knows it. It's just a debate about do you think the deposit beta is going to be 40, 50, whatever you think it's going to be. Um, so when you look at the cost of equity at the moment, which we calculate is about 16%, that's simply the inverse of the consensus earnings expectations. And it's another way of saying the market doesn't believe those earnings expectations. I guess the good news is if you think of those three items, muscle memory, it's kind of backward looking. As long as European banks deliver, it should fade. On the, are they over earning? Well, we're going to find out in 24, 25. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out uh, how much asset quality deteriorates and how much uh, interest rates, uh, uh, cost of deposits catches up. Um, and in terms of financial repression, well, quite a lot of people in this room have quite a bit of input into that. So um, if you want to stop that one, there's something you can do about it. Um, but maybe we leave that for later in the panel. Uh, we are going to talk about it too. Um, I have a, a number of follow-up questions I, just on what you said, but we'll do it later. Yes, go ahead. Uh, can, I, can I add to that? So indeed, uh, sometimes it depends also on societies that, uh, that it's being said that, okay, there is now uh, the case of over-profits being made. And it, it's always a bit difficult uh, since it becomes quite quickly very technical to say, well, let's look at the past 10 years. Let's look at the profitability of European banks compared to what we see in the past 12 months. And the, 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 the 30 seconds that you get where the media says, well, your time is now up, and so let's, <laughs> let's, let's move on. Uh, but let's, let's also not forget and that, that it was due to, it, it was impacted, of course, by the monetary policy uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of the ECB. And by the way, for the right reasons, let that not be a mistake, to actually decrease the interest rate. But it just has meant that banks' profitability of, of European banks have come under pressure for a long time. Uh, even uh, the, the rates in Europe started to become negative in 2014. It was only in 2020 when we started to discuss at what level can we also charge or pass on negative rates to customers, and then only with thresholds of, in our case, above 100,000 euros. So it took six years for us to, to move to a negative interest rate territory. Now, luckily, I mean, negative interest rate as a concept is already something that is quite difficult to understand um, uh, in real life. Uh, so that has taken a long time and also, and that's the second technical argument, of course in our balance sheet we have long dated assets with fixed, fixed patterns in them and therefore a pass through of higher deposit rates compared to a pass through or let's say revolving of your asset book is a complete different, uh, 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 a complete different factor and takes much longer. Now, as you can already figure out, and you're already looking at me like, what are you saying? It takes, <laughs> it's very technical, and it takes a long time. So that, that story is difficult, and still I'm going to repeat this story whenever I'm in the media, in, a, in a, as simple way as I can. But I'm also happy, uh, uh, also, Andrea, that you sometimes say something about it, because it just helps if a more impartial party like the ECB says these things also in public. But, but I think Bloomberg gives you more than 30 seconds, but none, nonetheless, we'll give you more time next time, but also there's an hour now, that's, so that's good uh, to go into more details for sure. Uh, Jean-Pierre, so far, uh, well, I wonder if you have any thoughts of what's been discussed so far, and I wonder, you have a, an enormous experience in, in banking. Uh, in this change of cycle, how would you play it strategically, uh, the changes that we've seen over the past uh, year? Well, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank uh, Andrea for having me here. He's a wonderful person, but I'll comment about it later. So at least he yeah. doesn't kick me out of the room before I speak. But I would like to come back about what happened during the negative interest rate period and then what we could look at now that rates are normalizing. During this negative rate period, bankers had to cut costs, work on raising capital, changing slightly their business model. In the meantime, which was the largest by market cap financial institution in continental Europe in July 2021? BNP? Santander? No. It was a fintech with 2,000 staff and 200 million euro net income. Market cap? 71 billion euro. It's called Edian. 
Yeah. Now its market cap is 25 billion euro. So when we bankers were cutting our cost, when we were looking to raise capital, we just missed 72 billion euro value creation because we were not looking at what was happening. We were right to cut cost. We were right to raise capital. But what can we do in the future not to miss the 72 billion euro value creation? And I think that when rates normalize today, we're saying, well, the best strategic development for a bank is to buy back shares. Fair enough. Buying back shares is the best ROE creation deal you can do. You have a 13% return on equity. You buy back shares at 50% discount, 24% ROE transaction. Nothing beats that. But it's very short term. In the meantime, do we have another Adian going to develop something? Probably not. Because now that rates are higher, Adian or the fintechs cannot fund themselves. And so the benefit of higher interest rate is to generate more net interest income on one side, but open up the game. And so should we think about a new strategy for bank and how can banking supervision support that? What I'm going to say here is easy to say because I'm not a bank CEO anymore, so <laughs> I can say things that I will never apply, okay? So that's fine. But nevertheless, you know, we need to think that bankers are no car manufacturer. It's an insult to some bankers, maybe or a compliment. I don't know how you look at car manufacturers. <laughs> Why? Because we could use OEM, meaning fintechs, to provide us with verticals that banks will not have either the resources or the critical size to develop. And let me give you some examples, because I spent the past two years so, to look at fintechs for one of the SPAC we raised. We didn't invest in the SPAC because we felt the valuations were wrong, and we were right not to invest because the valuation have collapsed. But I saw 132 fintechs in the past two years. And I can tell you that there are a lot of business model verticals today that bank can use in order to complement their business model instead of willing to develop them internally, take a stake in the fintech, have them to provide the service on a white label and develop. What are they? Some examples, I'm very happy to elaborate privately afterwards. Look at payment. I mentioned Adian. But there are you know, very interesting payment businesses. One of the most antiquated payment activity in the banking sector is cross-border payment when you go outside of the Eurozone with correspondent banking. It is ridiculous. It is ineffective, it is long, and it is expensive. There is a wonderful fintech called Banking Circle, which has a banking license and is developing cross-border payment on an extremely effective basis. What can bank do? Do you want Banking Circle to be the next Adian, or do you want to look at it in a very creative way. Let's look at e-commerce. On e-commerce, you can develop working capital financing, working with fintech in an extremely effective way where you have almost zero risk on the credit side because you get each time there's a payment, you get reimbursed. The return on equity on this business is 24%. It's not bad for a financing business. And you have a lot of fintechs doing that where banks can be involved. Let's look at Insurance. There are wonderful fintech on the insurtech side, which can be wonderful complement to a bank business model. Alan, a French fintech, you know the French, I don't tell you about <laughs> it. Life would be so much better without the French, they were seeing it in the credit. <laughs> but um, um, you know, Alan is a very, very good fintech, which if I known them before, I would have been offering them within the network of the bank. In Italy, in Germany, we are not present. And their offer is absolutely unbelievable. Rather than doing a joint venture with AXA, with Alliance or whatever, I mean, the quality of what is offered here is super good. You can do the same for car insurance. You can do the same for pet insurance, for instance, or others. You know, there are very, very good business models there. Let's look at wealth management. You have some fintech today which offer absolutely unbelievable wealth management offers, okay, which are cross-border super effective. I can tell you, if I had known the wealth management companies I looked at to invest in, and I was really willing to invest in them, I would have replaced two-thirds of the private banking staff of Unicredit just to offer their platform. 
and the quality of service to the client will be unbeatable, unbeatable. And now let's look at the last example, and afterwards I shut up. <laughs> yes, um, it's um, you know benefits and reward services. Benefits and reward services. It's a banking business. What do they do? They issue credit cards which are targeting specific services, meal, healthcare, or well-being. What do these companies do? They have a payment business. They have a huge float. You look at Edenred, which is listed, so you, know, you can uh, have an example. And really. Edenred has 500,000 corporate clients, 2 million merchants, 35 million individual clients, and a 6 billion float, where they pay zero interest because it's prepared card. So what should banks do? They should develop a benefits and reward services business. A FinTech is doing that. That's been bought by a French bank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm sure that they will develop very well. So what I'm saying here is that we should look, and the regulator should look at it, because it's a supervision issue to start with. Can banks develop their business by having vertical, so to a certain extent outsourcing part of their business to third party, which is, from a supervision point of view, not an obvious answer. Because you take operational risk, you take you know, the you know, risk of making sure that uh, the offer is going to work. But I think negative interest rate blinded us in terms of development. The normalization of rates blind us in terms of short-term strategy, we buy back shares. But what will be left afterwards? And as you mentioned, rates are not going to remain too high and might go back down. And we have a window to rethink the bank business model, because I think there's zero chance in Europe that we will have big bank um, you know, mergers because it does not make sense to have cross-border merger in Europe for big retail networks. So we need to think laterally and differently about what we can do. But I'm not a bank CEO, and I leave that to the bank CEOs <laughs> to do that and to the regulators to think about what to do. But can I, can I just ask as a follow-up question? Because it seems to me, on the one hand, you seem very excited about a number of areas, but you also seem, it seems there's, there's still perhaps a, an element of disappointment where you go back and think in the past, uh, there were opportunities that were good, but you see we were focused perhaps on just cutting costs and a number of other issues that prevented us from perhaps seeing uh, the future. And you said the word, perhaps we were blind in the past, but how do you stop being blind in, in, in the future? The sense that I get from what you say is that you believe parts of even this debate are antiquated, perhaps. The, that. Well, I, I think that, you know, why was I blinded? But any other banks here were blinded, no, because nobody created Adyen. So, you know, 72 billion, you know, that's a big miss, okay? So I think that bank CEOs are focused on the short-term issues, mm -hmm. and very few people in a bank are telling them, look, you can think laterally. I'm going to give you a last example, which is a provocation, but you know, I could not resist. <laughs> in, in 50 years, Andrea will be in paradise <laughs> as uh, all good uh, regulators. I will be in hell <laughs> as all bankers. I and uh, we will be discussing the impact <laughs> of the digital euro, which will not be capped anymore, but which will replace all the euros, and banks will have no more deposit. So the bank business model in 50 years will be a, a business model where if the digital euro develops, which I zero, uh, you know, um, uh, thing, I mean, I think that it has all the chance to develop and I zero doubt that it will not develop. The cap will be removed. The deposit will shift uh, towards um, uh, an asset. The bank will have to fight for deposit. They will price their deposit in a real way because today they don't price their deposit at all. Monetary transmission will be wonderful because it will be immediate, basically. And banks will have to manage their balance sheet in a completely different way. It will be in 50 years and Andreas and, and I will be having good time looking at the successors <laughs> of Claudia, Andreas and others saying, luckily, it did not happen when we were there. <laughs> <laughs> I see a lot of reactions, so yes, let's uh, Claudia, you, you, you can go first. Uh, yeah, ju ju just uh, a that? point which I think complements <laughs> <laughs> what you've just said. Uh, and clearly, it is very important for banks to rethink about their business model. And at the same time, we know that in the, what you might call the traditional banking area, there is overcapacity in Europe. Mm. And that so there is an exit, there is an exit problem. Uh, that exit problem has to do with the nature of banking, it has to do with politics as well. And I think that somehow that issue will have to be 
addressed. Now, the looking forward as opposed to looking back, I think what you just said is absolutely essential. And we should not forget that there is a huge digitalization, call it revolution, which is, uh, which is going on. And that offers lots of opportunities for banking, but it also offers, uh, it generates a number of threats because there are people outside the banking area that are actually have been much more nimble to, to exploit them. And uh, yes, there is a sense in which one can imagine that uh, a retail CBDC might be an issue, but it, it depends very much how it is defined, how it is designed. And on the other hand, one can think of the provision of a digital currency, uh, at particular at the wholesale level as providing huge opportunities again for banks. You can imagine a future in which you have uh, tokenized uh, CBDC at the wholesale level, you have tokenized deposits as some countries are already doing. And on that platform, you, have, you can tokenize assets. And all of that would generate huge opportunities in terms of the ability to generate new types of contracts and new type of profit opportunities. But you have to be mm. nimble enough to, to take advantage of that. Thank you for that, and now, of course. Thank you. I just want to go back to something that you said. So first of all, I fully agree with you that in the moment when banks are sort of rethinking about how to make their revenues uh, uh, sustainable, as Stuart was saying, this is still a big impediment in the price to book. Going for vertical business or trying to find opportunities, whether it's cooperation, whether it's acquisition of fintech or other entities, is fundamental. And I think boards and CEOs are currently Maybe we can hear CEO later, but they are currently doing it. But there is one aspect in which maybe I slightly disagree with you. As a former board member of you, maybe I constructive we, challenge we, you. We <laughs> always agree together at the time, but anyway. No, no, I just want to say one thing, which is I wish to believe that the share buyback maybe is not just an issue of short term. I wish to believe, and I, I hope not to be wrong, that the share buyback in the, in the short term is a boost to increase the price to book, at, uh, increase the attractiveness of the sector, and therefore give the possibility to banks to do even more this type of thinking that you have in mind mm. than if they have a very low uh, price to book. So I hope this is the way in which uh, the share buybacks are used at the moment. It's not just a matter of uh, increasing short term, uh, but it's a matter of making banks more sustainable in the longer term and more attractive in the longer term. No, but I, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying share buyback is a tactical approach. Yeah. It's not a strategic answer to what the banks are doing. If you but push your thinking to the end, you know, there will be only one share remaining or zero no, 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 share no, no. of a no, bank. No, no. And they it, there there will be, no, no, no. Yes. There will be, of course, a limit <laughs> to what this, yes. this can be done. But I wish to think it's a mean for a longer term vision. It's yes, not just a short term. Yes and no, because uh, as Stuart was mentioning, I mean, you know, uh, you cannot uh, just keep your share price high because you buy back shares. You need to, you know, keep your no, share no, price it high cannot be everything. because you, you it show cannot growth, be everything. an efficient sure. business model, which is de-risk, etc., etc. Like, sure. So the transformation of the business model needs no, to no, happen. No, no, no. They have to come to together, work. for sure. Yeah. They have to come together. I am loving this panel. Um, <laughs> uh, CEO in the room, I know you're, uh, Mr. Van Brinsvig, you're putting your hand up. Uh, the floor is, is yours. Is there so much you want to so much <laughs> <I> say? <heard laughs> <you. laughs> Let me try to box myself. So, uh, I, uh, clearly, uh, we need to continue to, to work on growth and development and diversification of our businesses. Um, um, in all honesty, uh, in, and, uh, even in the times that interest rates were low or negative, we have invested considerably in all kinds of uh, fintechs and the likes, some of which, which have not turned out to be too good of a success. And that's where, uh, no, just uh, if I say euphemistically, and there comes also the crux of the matter in, in the fact that we are also, first of all, there to keep our customers safe. And there is a limitation also in the construct of regulation, and that's that tension, the, in that field of tension, I struggle, to be honest. Since on the one hand we want to diversify, we need to do that in a profitable way because if we do not make our returns, then the question is why do we invest in things that are sub-hurdle? And that's a logical question when you're uh, subject to the, uh, the pressure of the market. Um, <coughs> um, and in that setting of how then to be able to grow, uh, and uh, I think that uh, there was a, a part of it, the, the, the speech was partly, or question was on, on, on your speech on the on non-bank FIs. 
Uh, we've seen in Europe that the total, and that's only the balance sheet, I just named this as an example, not only about non-bank advice, is that, non that if you look at the total size of business lending in Europe from 2008 to 2022, I think those are even ECB figures, that grew from uh, 7.3 to 10 trillion. And uh, of that, more than 80% came from the non-banking advice sector. As a matter of fact, and people often say that in Europe, is largely, business is largely a banker's market. But if you look at total business lending in Europe, 52% already comes from non-bank advice. No. And that means that within a very short period of time, part of what's happening in the world has been, uh, is taking place outside of the banks, which is impeding on growth. Whether the society likes it or not, I leave that in the middle, that's, but that's one of the struggles. If you look at the number of the developments, whether it is in crypto or DLT, um, um, uh, then uh, uh, the, 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 for the right safety reasons, uh, we are limiting ourselves and supervisors are also warning us to be careful not actually to, to play around with it. And I've, I, by the way, I fully subscribe to it and I'm very careful to introduce any uh, Bitcoin services to any retail customers in any of the markets in which we're active. Wholesale is a bit different. But it also means that also part of that playing field is outside of our sector. And so, and I can name a few more, but I will not do that. So in the end, and we need, indeed, indeed, we need to have that search for growth to the development for the markets in which we operate in the real economies. But the question is, where do we strike the balance bet between being safe in our own right, but sometimes it's described as a waterbed. You push here and it comes out there, but out there is not with us because we're not in it. So I'm all for safety, which is very good. I was not a zero for nothing in my previous life. But we need to balance it also with where do we think banks can fulfill a core role? And whether that's all the fintechs or not, I, I want to park the debate, but I think it's important that we also keep looking at where can banks play a role? And of course, then put the bells and whistles around it to keep us safe. It, that's maybe, yeah, that's maybe, go ahead, do you have a question? No, I just had a question because you've used the word safe and safety uh, many times in, in, in your <laughs> answer now. Uh, I wonder basically, uh, that's 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 the issue when when your clients go to you where you know the average person that banks with with ing that's what they value them more so so everything else in this universe it maybe doesn't speak to them so so the appetite is not there so so your business it's it's positioned in a different way to to some of the other opportunities we're talking well, about different things well partially because i mean it, it it's not about safety or it can be safety and mm -hmm. and but and, and i think what i'm trying to advocate is it 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 can be safety and so let's also make sure we create the room to invest in new things as well, a bit to uh, uh, what you said. In that setting, by the way, and uh, you talked about digital, 62% uh, of our customers we deal with only through the mobile. We have 38 million customers, 97% of our interaction with the customers is only digital. So we can be digital without being a fintech. We do, by the way, collaborate with a number of fintechs. and. We do, by the way, put a number of their solutions in place when we can, but in the end, digital is also a means to an end. It is something about either, it's about a, a getting a superior customer experience. It's either easier or instant or personal or relevant, D and digital is an enabler to it. It is not a means to an end. Let's be digital. Now, we're digital because we can provide a better service to customers. And in that digital, the question is, how far do you then go? And can you do more than that you do now? And are there limitations or inhibitions that we see as banks, and I think that is indeed the case, that other companies don't have. And that's why we need to find a middle ground. I also want to say something about M&A, if you allow me. So I would love to do M&A, well, when it makes sense, and all these, before you know the endless community. <laughs> and, and, and I've said, uh, in the, so, uh, but, but there is also, as, and, and uh, you are a, a European, and, I, and, and I'm the same. And in the and and but in the bank setting, what we do still see, and that's just fact, that's not views. There is compartmentalization of capital and liquidity, and that is an inhibitor for European cons consolidation. Um, even if you would make an acquisition, also given the fact that the interest rates have grown so quickly over the past number of months, it means that from an accounting point of view, uh, you have to uh, uh, basically write down your existing mortgage book, and as you may know, ING has a considerable mortgage book, which is largely fixed rate in Germany, in Belgium, and the Netherlands. Um, that means that if you make these type of acquisitions, you write it down 
because you have invested in mortgages at rates which were considerably lower in the past than now. And of course, it will come back to you over time, but on a day one acquisition, from a day one acquisition point of view, it can have such a negative capital impact that it just makes it impossible to do an acquisition. And we need to solve those things. Now, unfortunately, personal opinion, I think there are more non-Europeans coming to power these days. And I think it's important that if we want to maintain also for the stability and the fluidity of the capital liquidity in, the, in, the, in, in Europe, we need to have one Europe. So I'm not too optimistic short term about the direction we're traveling into, but, we, but that needs to be fixed. And to the account, it needs to be fixed to get to that cross-border M&A uh, 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 setting that people would like to, to make the banking sector in Europe healthier. So you think this idea of European mega champions and this massive uh, cross-border operations, we've heard it for many years now uh, and hasn't fully materialized. Well, you say you, you sound still pretty downbeat. You're, you're not yeah, very know, optimistic. I know it's Friday, thing. but yes, yeah. So, so what's going to change this now that you have, uh, well, you're at the ECB. So, so uh, what would you like to see uh, realistically to change at least the, the tone finally? No, well, this is not a, the message for the ECB. I think that the ECB has given all the right messages. Okay. As a matter of fact, we have been speaking about it now and again, how to, to do something about it. But it's, it's damn hard in Europe. And, it's, uh, and uh, we need to continue to find that path. I think we need to continue to to advocate it. I'm very happy with the way that, that the ECB advocates that view. And I think we just, should just continue on that path because it, in the end, that will be better for Europe. Both uh, Stuart and uh, Jean-Pierre, I, I believe you had comments you wanted to make, but Stuart, if we go with you first. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of make the point. Um, I agree with, a lot with uh, what's been said, but I don't think it's either or in terms of share buybacks or investments. I mean, if it's you look at both. the the profitability of European banks, if you say they're going to make a 12% return on tangible, let's say risk weight assets grow at 3%, you can do an 80% payout, 50% cash, 30% share buyback, that should be reasonably um, recurring. When it comes to on the investment side, I think we have to face facts. Banks are not very good at technology. Uh, I mean, if you look at the amount of money that banks throw at technology, if you say most banks spend 10% of revenues on technology spending, let's say about 40% of that is so-called change the bank, those figures dwarf anything that Adyen and Co. do in R&D, and yet the bang for buck that banks get for it is not terribly good, and we can kind of go into why that is uh, that case. That's not to say they shouldn't do it, and not to say that uh, investors will look for banks to come up with some longer-term growth uh, outlook, but I think we have to accept that there's a kind of a, a skill set shortage and a... Um, how do you say, uh, sort of institutional barriers to expecting a great deal of uh, success uh, out of that. So, as Stephen said, you know, M&A is damn hard, but I think expecting banks to reinvent themselves technology-wise is probably damn hard as well. And just a quick follow-up. Before you said uh, European banks had a, had a part of perception problem, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if you could elaborate more on that, but I guess more to the point, how to change it. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I don't think it's a sort of silver bullet, but I think the way to change it is if we're saying that banks are over-earning and when rates come down they won't make as much money and banks will have some bad debts because of the macro, we're going to see that. So you know, that, that'll play itself out in the next couple of years. So I don't think there's anything that the banks have to do there other than show their resilience. And my personal view is I think they will be resilient and I think the problems will be probably in the non-bank space or somewhere else. But let's face it, this is, if we're going to get a recession, this has been the most talked about and most anticipated recession of all time. So you'll be a pretty dumb chief risk officer not to have kind of thought about <laughs> any different opportunities. I would have thought. Um, and on the muscle memory issue, I mean, eventually, if they keep buying back shares and they keep delivering, I mean, we've calculated if you assume that the sector has an 80% payout ratio for all time, and I, I guess maybe people in this room might disagree with that, but if they were to do so, um, then basically the current market capitalization, a trillion euros, you will get a trillion euros back by 2029. So when we sit here in the 2030 symposium, um, either the share prices are much, much higher, or we were very wrong on the earnings outlook, but <laughs> something is wrong with that mathematics. Mm. Now, our bet is uh, it's the share prices that are wrong. Let's hope so. Okay, interesting. Just a few comments. Uh, you know, just going back to the technology side, I, have, I am convinced that banks will not be able to develop internally the verticals I mentioned. This is why I think the business model is car manufacturer, where you use OEM who will provide the verticals. It's a banking supervision issue. How do you allow banks to do that, to have suppliers, basically, for their business model? And uh, when you look at how these fintechs develop, the agility, the mobility they have, and uh, you know, the, the ability to find 
fine-tune the product for the client satisfaction side. I think it's super unlikely that banks will be able to do that. And I mean, I wasn't able to do that, but you know, I mean, they are much better chief executive now, but nevertheless, I think it's very difficult. The second point is on, on, on M&A. In Europe, we have a fragmented market. If you look at European GDP, not very different from the US. If you look at the number of customers, not very different from the US. But on the retail side, you have 16, 18 different markets. It's extremely difficult to generate synergies between different retail businesses. So, you know, I don't think that bank m &A is going to really create value when you look at it and compare it to share buyback. -back. Share buyback -back is very good now and I never said the opposite, but it's a not an end in itself. Okay? You need to look at how the business model develops because the sustainability of the PE will be based on the ability of banks to show growth and proper profitability. So share buyback is a way to push up the price short term, but when you stop the share buyback, you're like the bunny, yeah, you know, and you look like Turk, and then you go down on yeah, the no. cliff. So you, know, you basically have um, you know, to, to see, and I'm, on, on purpose, you know, being, uh, you know, exaggerating a little bit about the shift of the business model, there are much more important things to do in changing the bank. But I think that we need to think a little bit laterally in order to see there are alternatives. Otherwise, there will be new ADN and the banks will miss this Im immense value creation that we have missed uh, on, on the e-commerce side. And uh, there's a, the, you also mentioned, and we hear this repeatedly, when you look at the big numbers, the difference between the US and, and Europe is actually not uh, that different. But again, when you go back to valuations, even perception of the idea of who are the big champions. No, no, but the big numbers between Europe and US are not different on a consolidated Ex basis. <laughs> but we have series of individual markets which are segmented. So you cannot develop very zero synergies between two retail banks in Europe, zero. Okay, so, so doing M&A for the retail business is impossible, except if you have a digital offer, you have a very good wealth management business. I think on the wealth management side, you can have a, a very good cross-border digital offers. There are few fintechs or, you know, which offer that. If I had known them, I, as I said, I would have been buying them, not partnering, but buying them to offer you know, a, a pan-European product. So, but uh, besides wealth management, on the pure retail side, mergers do not work. And that I'm very, very convinced. Yeah. But by, by the way, uh, the, the, it is not only capital and liquidity limitations, but also regulation on data, different mortgage requirements regulations. So if you can't front to back integrate these products, that's currently, you know, there's a stack of paper so high in the Netherlands of the requirements of a mortgage and the same stack of paper is in Germany, mm -hmm. in German, <laughs> and, and, but then completely differently and the same in Belgium and France or where have you. But, and, and so because that is 90% and we have tried some of it, to be honest, and so, uh, but in the end, if you want to do cross-border retail banking, it, it bodes for what we call organizational integration. That means not only, uh, that means and the balance sheet and the capital and liquidity, that means your IT systems, but it also means product integration. If you can't realize product integration because the products are the same, the benefits, the benefits will be limited. So when talking about, and that's of course the advantage that the state has, uh, there is one type of mortgage, well, there are of course more mortgages, but there is one regulation around mortgages, there is one regulation around data, and uh, there is one regulation about customer safety, and so forth, and so forth. So it's not only capital liquidity, it's the whole stack, because the product integration, the level of product integration you can do, determines how much you can integrate your organizations. And of course that's problematic, but again, this goes back to the issue, some would say, uh, if you think about just the European Union as a, as a whole, this is a massive single market. It is clearly the, the, the money maker, certainly for the Union, but definitely when it comes to this particular sector, it is massively underused. Yeah. So then, again, going back to my question, I asked you this before, but then what changes this dynamic? I know you said you endorsed the message from the European Central Bank, then you mentioned the politics. What's going to change uh, these dynamics? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there, there needs to I mean, be no, something I, I, that you look, think this is what's I, I, look, required uh, to, to well, change this. <clears throat> yeah, I don't have, to be honest, I don't know. Huh? So I think mm -hmm. that it's, it's just, I think that, that the realization of Europe, and I think we need to be better in that, that it is for the benefit of the population of Europe that, that uh, we have an, uh, a, a more aligned and harmonized uh, um, um, uh, state of, uh, of uh, European legislation that then in the end will come to back to the banking union. I mean, 
I mean, in the end, if you let's say have a one deposit and one lending market, clearly it is much more efficient how lending and, dep and deposits and savings will clear. That is to the benefit of Europe. And that needs to be seen. And currently that is not sufficiently the case. But perhaps you have a better answer. <laughs> no, I Ladies first. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, I think we go back a little bit to the discussion we had yesterday when uh, Jacques Delarossier and also uh, Anna Bottin was talking. And I think here the banking sector itself actually has a bigger role to play because here, I believe in particular European supervisor and banks are actually <coughs> the same boat because they all want a more integrated market and the removal of this impediment. So perhaps the banks themselves can actually play a big push in this direction. And maybe, hopefully, politics and regulation and all these impediments will follow. But it's maybe the banks that have to show how beneficial this integration actually can be. Yeah, it can be awesome. one element that certainly may help. Yeah, I think nothing will change the dynamic, basically. So it's not going to work. Let's be super <laughs> no, but let's be super clear about it. We are not all going to be uh, speaking Dutch or French or whatever, because you need to have one single market. You know, we say we have one single European market. It's true and it's wrong because we have, you know, the market in France is different to a market in Germany, to the Netherlands, when you want to issue a mortgage very different. You're not going to have a convergence of, um, you know, the, the local laws, you know, or, you know, the, all the local specificities or tax, etc. well beyond, uh, you know, the 50 years I mentioned. Okay, so that's not going to work. And, and let's do that. But there is one thing which can develop. So this is why I think EDIS or whatever, forget about it. You know, it, 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 no, no, but you know, we were speaking about EDIS for so many years. It's not here, it's never going to be here. And I'm making a statement here. But where we can progress is on the capital market side. And on the capital market side, you know, Europe is behind. And it's a real problem for European banks or for European investors. So we need to have a change in the pension fund and in the insurance company company's ability to invest in European assets. So the Commission did its work in terms of the prospectus and the regulation, but where are the investors? And the investors have not developing enough because we are lacking versus the US the size of the pension fund and the ability of insurance companies to invest. So if there is a priority today, it's not to have a convergence of tax regulation, of uh, you know, uh, employment regulation, of mortgage regulations, aren't going to work. But it's on the capital market side to develop much more investors to fund our retirement. And, and it's super important for me now to fund the retirement, <laughs> okay, much more than 10 years ago, you know, and, and to be able to, you know, uh, uh, access and develop debt and um, uh, equity capital market to fund growth in Europe. We don't have today in Europe the ability to provide growth capital is ridiculously low. It's growing, but it's super low compared to the US in Asia. Mm -hmm. On the debt side, when uh, Andrea and I discuss in 50 years the digital euro, we need to have more capital market to be able to fund the, the banks and others. So, you know, the big focus has to be on that. The Capital Markets Union. And uh, the other point, because again, maybe I should have said this before, there will be questions uh, from the audience at the end and also uh, if you can send them uh, online. So there's a part, however, that I do want to introduce because it was mentioned at the start of the, the session which had to do with, uh, Stuart, you mentioned financial uh, repression. One of the big topics uh, this year certainly uh, that connects, well, everything we've talked about the politics, the change in monetary policy, the higher rates uh, has been the pushback that we've seen from a number of governments and jurisdictions uh, this year with a number of bank tax that have been introduced. Uh, I wonder, and this I leave it to you, whether it has been a successful operation or not. And uh, how would you describe this phenomenon that we've seen this year, because some of these governments, even if it didn't really work in terms of the funding they were able to bring in, still defend it as an idea. They say it was right to do it. Yeah, I mean, so it depends on how you define success. I mean, if success was finding three billion euros at two, <laughs> two, two minutes to midnight, then I guess it was a success for those governments. <laughs> but I mean, it has repercussions. I and mean, in every investor discussion I have, it comes up. Um, I think on the bank tax side, if you invest in European bank equities or credit, kind of, it comes with the territory. You know, the crazy Europeans are going to do crazy things every so often. You kind of expect it from the politicians to some extent. It's disappointing, but it's not totally um, unexpected. And you can do your homework in terms of which governments have the biggest problems and therefore it might be the bigger problem. I think the more corrosive uh, 
um, issue this year has been the MRR, because you expect politicians to do weird things, but you don't necessarily expect financially literate central bankers to do um, weird things. And I think that the... You're a M- brave man. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I think on the, the MRR, I mean, it's not been explained what exactly the purpose of that is. And you can say, OK, it's only a couple of billion euros, and what does that matter? But when you have some central bankers talking about 5 to 10% uh, MRRs, I mean, that is very corrosive, because if you're an investor in America, you don't know if that's, if that's um, consensus view, if that's sort of at, at the margin of thinking. So I think it just is another factor which adds to the cost of equity of the sector. And I wouldn't overstate it. There's other factors which are very important as well. But you kind of layer these things upon um, themselves. And it's another reason to not buy European equities and just go and buy JP Morgan because you're never going to lose your job if you own JP Morgan shares. So why bother? Mm. Can I add so one thing there? So maybe it's more a generic point. So uh, in the end, and I think that's important, that it is good for economies if banks can grow and put their money back in the economies and that also means that you need to have banks that are valued properly and that make good returns because those good returns will filter back in it will keep the banks safe they will the capital will go up they can invest etc and for for investors and the large the, the majority of the or the majority 50 percent of the, or, or the majority of the funds that are invested in european banks comes from the states or comes from american investors and in the end, what these investors want is predictability and reliability. And things like, in different countries, certain bank taxes, uh, like in the Netherlands, uh, with an outgoing cabinet discussing a budget, and then uh, on one day of the budget, a few people saying, hey, why don't we swap a few billions left, right, and center, uh, including a bank tax uh, 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 that, is, that is just, it was not even... Uh, it was not, not even tried to explain, just no, for budgetary reasons, hide, uh, increase the bank tax, which initially was there, and by the way, in the Netherlands, which is global, not even local, which is even more ridiculous, based on the fact that you want more safety uh, at a time when banks were more dependent on, an, on one country, and, and, and ING was at that time, seemed to be too big to fail. But you just even don't go back to the reasoning of that law anymore and just fill a, 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 a tax gap. It's just not good. And it's just an example of the reliability or how investors will look at the reliability and predictability of the European governmental landscapes to see where they will invest. And we need to improve on that. For sure. Professor? Just uh, following up on that, actually, if you look at uh, how the bank, uh, the tax on the bank profit uh, has been introduced, is actually there is a big heterogeneity across countries. This is really surprising, both in the size of these tax, in the criteria for the application. For example, if you look at Ireland, uh, it only applies to banks that have taken public support in the past. It, sometimes it's one, una tantum, sometimes it's more permanent tax, sometimes it's... Uh, so it, it, it varies a lot. So this increase also the uh, unpredictability or the difficulty for an American investor to understand, because as he said, ultimately, American investor will look at the European banking sector. I'm not so sure how much they're actually able to distinguish each single country and to make predictions out of all these differences. And can I just, as a follow-up on this, uh, Stuart, you said it, it depends on what you mean or how you define success. If $3 billion a minute to midnight is considered success, then it would have been successful. Some of these governments would say those $3 billions to my voters matter, so I think it was uh, successful. It's clear from uh, what you said that you think the damage is bigger than what's uh, actually achieved. But just perhaps on, and to be fair, on a more perhaps intellectual basis, what some of these governments say is that it was objective, that the pass-through was slow, and that them jumping into the spray accelerated this process. Is that fair, or do you think, well, that's a, that's a way to excuse maybe what turned out to be a bad market move? Well, I mean, I, I think that if you say the, the, the rationale for it was the banks were over-earning, I, I would say the banks are not over-earning. I think the mm-hmm. banks went from under-earning and are now back to a level of more normal um, profitability, and I think to some of the way the bank taxes have been constructed are, are not set to really get to that answer of are they over earning? Because if you're looking at revenues versus profits and all those kind of things, it's it creates some um, odd incentives. So I think if you look at um, Spain, if the if the if the argument was that was intended to lead Spanish banks to pay more to savers, it seems to have done the opposite. I think Spain has the lowest deposit beta in Europe right now. So. 
You could argue it's just been a wealth transfer from Spanish savers to the Spanish treasury, and the banks have just been the pass-through mechanism. Um, arguably, if you wanted to reprice deposits, the better way of doing that was as Belgium did it, where you just go out with a very attractive one-year yeah. offer yes. and 7% yes. of the deposit base moves overnight. Which they said they did in response to this. So again, it was a different carrot and stick, but the, the rationale behind it was similar. Is it a problem with the execution but, then? But I guess the point is, Investors are not crybabies. They tell us what the rules of the game are, and we can price that risk effectively. It's when the rules of the game keep changing, there will be a, 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 a knock-on impact in terms of the cost of equity. And if that's the price that you want to pay, fine. Just be overt about it. Say, this is what we want to do. Mm -hmm. This is the ROE the banking sector is allowed to generate. We have a utility. This is the ROE we accept, and anything above that belongs to us, and anything below that belongs to you. And But I think it's that lack of knowledge of the rules of the game which leads to that cost of equity being unusually high. Partly. And uh, it is a, a banking supervision. Before we take it to questions from the audience, uh, I have to ask you, of course, about risks that you see it playing out in the medium to, to long term, perhaps. Uh, Mr. Body, I know you wanted to comment on this specifically, so I'm going to give you. Yes, yeah, so we go back Sarah. to the third but that I mentioned at the beginning. Yes. <laughs> Um, actually, it ties in very closely with uh, what we heard, but if you put it in, in, in the bigger context, and it's the fact that, um, and we had a special chapter in the annual economic report last year looking at the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. If you look longer term, I think that the, the biggest risk to uh, macroeconomic, financial and price stability that we see is the trajectory of government debt. And the fact that, um, Initial conditions, and again, maybe people are not fully aware of this, were extraordinarily, uh, well, let's say, unprecedented again by historical standards. The, if you look across the world, and this is not just uh, particular countries, but across the world, the median level of the uh, government debt to GDP ratio, even before COVID, was already at historical peaks it was roughly at the same level in line with what we had seen during the Second World War. But of course, interest rates at the time were so low that the debt burden, the interest burden on the debt, was, had never actually been so light in, in history. I mean, again, it's rather, it's rather bizarre that people were, if you like, referring to that period as the new normal. I mean, if anything, it was, if you like, the new abnormal. And of course, now things have changed. Um, and if you look ahead, if you look ahead, even with interest rates be, being below growth rates, and they are not now, the, the debt trajectory is, is extremely concerning. And that does not even include the new demands that we are putting on, on fiscal policy in terms, for example, of the green transition, more defense spending, and of course the aging populations that typically are not taken into account in these numbers. And moreover, what I feel is that Following the COVID crisis, which actually led to a further uh, fiscal policy response, um, the, the, the general population has now got used to this strong support from the public sector. So the politics are going to be very much against getting these things under control. But, and if you look historically, and not least in this part of the world, I mean, the very high debt levels have created problems for financial stability, but also for macroeconomic stability and for inflation. And in a way, even the losses that we saw uh, in the materialization of interest rate risk were largely losses on public sector securities. And moreover, to complicate matters further, the fact that central banks have been buying quite a lot of that mm. debt, at least in some jurisdictions, means that although you may think that the, that government debt is uh, long maturities, if you consolidate the public sector debt and you consolidate it with the central bank, you will realize, and this again ties back to what we were discussing earlier, that a lot of that debt actually is at overnight rates. It's indexed at overnight rates because of bank reserves. That doesn't show up as higher interest payments for the government, but shows up as lower revenues for the government. And of course, central bank losses, that again creates a problem. So I think that going forward, I think we really have to be, uh, watch out very closely the public sector side of the equation. Well, thank you for that. And Professor, of course. 
Yeah, so if I, as a chair of a risk committee, what I, I am most worried about, I think is the same as supervisors are also worried about, which is uh, waking up one morning or having any way sudden disruption somewhere in the system. I think this is what really uh, keeps me awake at night, if you want to ask me that question, if you, uh, if you can say that question. So anything that has to do with geopolitical risk at the moment, for example, which is not related to interest rate, but of course this, may, this can be a very sudden disruption. And related to that, a little bit all the sanction regimes actually become more and more aware of the legal risk that we may be facing. Because banks anyway rely on the rule of law, contracts for certain operations, but in times of wars, maybe the rule of law is not always applied in the way we would predict. And that also can, imp can impose substantial losses on banks. So that is what I'm worried most about. So when I have my meetings, what I keep saying is the what if question. What, how do we actually manage this potential tail risk? And of course, the banks cannot and probably should not start acting, thinking that there may be this tail risk, but they should be ready to act should this risk materialize. So stress testing, I think, is something that we need to put a lot of emphasis on. And it's not necessarily the stress test the DBA, the ECB conduct, but it's the internal stress testing of the banks. So banks do much more stress testing than the regulatory stress testing is concerned. So going back to Mr. Barr this morning, liquidity stress testing, assumption in behavioral model of deposits, we know very little about it. So these are what the emphasis that I uh, personally would put uh, right now very highly. So I share very much one of the latest speeches of uh, Andrea when he was saying going forward, this is not just about capital, this is about supervision, being preventive on one side, but more detective and corrective measure. I think that is really what matters the most. And as Mr. Barr was remembering us this morning, it's a matter of Credit Suisse, Silicon Valley Bank, they're not coming out of nothing. They are coming out of a period of weaknesses that had not been solved. So this is, I think, where we, the focus should be going forward, rather than regulation or increased capital in itself. Thank you for that. And uh, Jean-Pierre? No, I, I fully agree with what uh, Elena said. I, I think there are well-known risks in the banking sector. You mentioned some, you mentioned some as well. I think there are two risks which are new to a certain extent. We see the liquidity risk because of the change of behaviors, and it was very well explained this morning as well. And that's something which is very difficult to model, first of all, and we have models which are changing because of that, basically, because the customers are changing. And uh, you know, we have not mentioned cyber risk, and I, I'm exactly. the chair of an IT company as well, which provides very good cyber services, actually, <laughs> if um, you, know, you would like to, to use them. But um, you know, the, um, the, the cyber side is uh, what was keeping me awake at night, actually. And um, you know, yeah. if uh, the system is blocked for whatever reason, for one day a bank can handle, for two days it becomes difficult, and for three days you don't have any more problem because you don't have the bank anymore. So uh, I think the, the, the cyber risk and management or cyber risk on the payment side, it's a, a payment issue, first of all, is something which um, you know, has to be looked at extremely, is being looked at, but you know, the cyber thieves or criminals are very innovative, and so it, it is a, a new risk which has to be looked at very, very carefully. Well, thank you uh, for that. Unless there's uh, further comments, I will now switch uh, to the audience and maybe we can uh, take questions uh, from them. So if you have a question, just uh, introduce yourself and put the question. Thank you, ver thank you very much. Uh, Nicolas Veron at Bruegel and Peterson Institute. Um, I cannot resist uh, expanding on what um, Elena said about uh, referring to Jacques Delarosier's remarks yesterday, uh, which were uh, also uh, uh, taken up by Andrea in uh, uh, remarks yesterday night. Um, the position of the banking industry in terms of the completion of banking union, and I guess uh, uh, Jean-Pierre <laughs> gave us uh, his opinion already, but uh, my question is to Stuart and uh, Mr. Van Rijswijk. Um, why is it that large European banks, or at least a critical mass of large European banks, are not pushing more for completion of banking union, given the uh, strategic advantages that appear blindingly obvious to most of us here? Thank you. <laughs> we are. <laughs> We're just not very successful 
That's reality. Yeah. So I think that uh, for years uh, we have been talking uh, with uh, the European Parliament and the European Commission and with our own political uh, leaders in the countries. There are uh, a, a number of challenges, uh, which is also in the sovereignty of the countries, people feeling that uh, why should we merge our deposits with those of some other countries and if then um, 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 uh, uh, bankru bankruptcy laws in countries differ, uh, what would that mean uh, uh, in terms of my deposits then going to deposits or, or going to uh, make up for holes that are being put in some other countries? So there is still a big divide between different countries in what they feel who should pay the bill if something goes wrong. And at least, let me speak for myself, I have not been sufficiently successful to change that opinion. I, th I think, the, from my perception, I think the industry is split. I think some CEOs see value in it, some CEOs don't. And the counterfactual of just buying back your stock, it's a no-brainer. I mean, if you have to explain to a sceptical investor why you're doing a cross-border deal, which you know they won't like, versus just buying back your shares where there's zero execution risk, that's a very high hurdle. And for you to be able to surmount that hurdle, you need, I think, some sort of narrative shift to say, this is why it now makes sense. The obvious narrative shift, whether it would be real or not, but in terms of giving you that air cover would be EDIS. I agree with Jean-Pierre, that's never going to happen. Yeah. So from that perspective, kind of, I think the industry finds itself somewhat hamstrung. Now I take the point, the industry could be the leader and could make the case to the politicians as to why EDIS should happen. But I think if you secretly polled CEOs of European banks, I think you'd get a split jury on whether they actually believe that or not. Maybe I'm wrong. And I heard someone here, and I think it was you, uh, Irene, who said, but why? Do you want do you want it? So maybe you want to. Uh, Actually, I, I wish we could integrate the two panels. I, I, I'm speaking afterwards. Yeah, sorry. No, I mean it is an instinct. They say you said, yeah, it is is never going to happen, and this is exactly the attitude. Why it's not happening? Because it's uh, everybody is so giving up on this. And I can assure you that's not true because what we've seen in these past five years in the Parliament and in the European Union is that we are capable of doing things that were not imaginable even a few months earlier. So when there is the political will, and by political will it's not only the will of some politicians, the political will and the political power rests in all the actors. And the banking sector has a much bigger political power that they are wishing to admit. The issue is that how do you spend your political power? So I've met quite a few of you in these years, and, uh, and I know how passionate you can be when you have to advocate something. So it's just <laughs> that you have to direct your passion and your energy towards something that is also long-term, strategic, and that help us, because us in Parliament and in the Commission, you've acknowledged that, we do everything we can to try to push on these projects. They think that, you know, I don't want to point fingers, I don't want to do name shame and blah, 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 but you know what I'm referring and who I'm referring to and where you have to direct your passionate advocacy for a more integrated banking sector. So, honestly, when you say it's not going to happen, it is going to happen if you help us, if we can all work together, because we've done things that were unimaginable, and if you look back, you, you know that we've done that. Uh, well, Sorry. Aidan, no. thank you so much, and forgive me for... <laughs> <laughs> but I heard you go why, so I thought uh, I had no. to. J just um, thank you very much for this passionate <laughs> plead for Idis. Let's assume it happens. I don't think it's going to change anything about bank merger and integration and creating you know, pan-European champion. Because there's no rational and there's no synergy on the retail banking side between different countries. So we can say whatever we want to say, it's not going to work. And that, I mean, I have a very high level of certainty. That is, I mean, it might help, but not very much. And there are other things that bankers should do. Wow. What is super important is to work on the capital market union, not on what the commission has been doing, but on making sure that we can have more investors to buy European shares and European debt. This is what is putting us back versus the US side. You mentioned that you know, the largest part of uh, shareholders of, of uh, European banks, like on uh, many uh, European shares, are non-European. 
And that's a problem for economies which are the same size, basically. So, you know, if we had to do something important for Europe to promote growth, to fund companies on the equity side, on the growth, on the growth equity side, on the debt side, it's much more on the investor side that we need to focus. She will be back for the next panel, so I think uh, maybe we, we <laughs> give the mic, but after. Uh, if there's, are there any more questions uh, from the audience? This is the final one that we're going to be able to take because we're running out of time. So, yes. Hi, thanks. Uh, Giovanni Bassani from the ECB. Uh, Mr. Mustier, you're really very pessimist. I mean, I mean if you wait for uh, everybody speaking the same language, I think that's uh, really not, never going to happen. Um, to Mr. Varansvig, uh, there is one issue that I always be curious about. Why do we have uh, JP Morgan, Societas Europea, we have, uh, Morgan Stanley, Societas Europea, but you don't transform yourself in a Societas Europea, and so all this problem, at least, of um, fragmentation and compartmentalization of capital and liquidity would disappear. So we, we need to have, I would say, ING Societas Europea, like we have uh, um, Goldman Sachs Societas Europea, Unicredit Societas Europea. Why that does not happen? Yeah. At least it would be a first step, uh, and you can do it without any legitimate changes of... Um, um, Treaty changes whatsoever. Thank yeah. you. It's a good point because I, uh, I was almost going to say in the whole EDIS uh, discussion, thank you, by the way, for your passion. <laughs> I shared it, by the way. Is that, uh, um, is that indeed that the, the fact that if we would move the flag 150 kilometers uh, eastbound from Amsterdam to somewhere in Germany, Gelsenkirchen, for all I care, huh? we just put it there, then that changes my macro prudential buffers. That, that just, and, and nothing changed. And so, so why are we doing this to each other? But that's just one element of it. Um, I, I, the, the, on, the, on this uh, uh, association European, that, that is a possibility. But if you already have activities in different markets with, sub, with subs, that you cannot suddenly, but this is, is going to become a very technical and legal story, transform just in an, uh, a European association like the American banks have done. For new activities, by the way, this is a very good one. So it will, it can help to some extent, but it will not take away everything that we just talked about. Well, thank you for that. We have reached uh, the end of the session, but before we leave, uh Mr. Andrea, there, uh, well, there's a message uh, for you, and it's uh, Jean-Pierre Moustier who's going to deliver it. Uh, I think this is going to be more optimistic about something that will happen. Well, I am optimistic for the banking sectors, but not only this, but that's another story. Let's not go back to that. There's another panel. And I was tasked by the, um, by the panel to say thank you. And uh, I would like to say thank you, not only on behalf of the panel, but also for the years where we worked together when I was at the European Banking Federation, and specifically the few months uh, where we were in lockdown and we were discussing, you know, stopping the dividend. And, uh, you know, we had this, uh, you know, very close interaction. And I discovered the human being behind the regulator, basically. And uh, <laughs> I think that we owe you immense thanks for what you have been doing for the banking sector. And when I'm saying immense, is the future generation will see and will realize what you've been doing, which is unbelievably good. So thank you very much for that. And you know, when I'm here and speaking to all your team members, the respect they have, but more importantly, the proud that we see with all the members of the ESM to be working at the ESM speaks a lot for what you have achieved. And I think you did something absolutely extraordinary. And so thank you very much for that. And I would like to, of course, you know, pass our best wishes to your successor and uh, wish her you know, best success as well for you know, a very interesting days of EDIS, uh, digital banking, <laughs> fintech, and, and others you know, that uh, we are going to see. So good luck to you and thank you very much to Andrea. Thank you. Well, on that note.